Welcome back to Dubai Expo 2020. You're with me, Ben Ibrahim. And very shortly, we're going to invite Unche Jaffrey or Mr. Jaffrey to come back to the screen and the floor, but this time, not as a speaker, but as a moderator for the topic, Transcending Borders, Breaking Down Barriers to Collaboration. Let's enjoy this. Over to you, Mr. Jaffrey. Thank you, uh, Ben. Um, and very good morning to everyone. Um, as Ben says, my name is Jaffrey, and I'm the CEO of CRESS. And I'm here with a very distinguished uh, panel of speakers um, from the best minds uh, in the world in the topic of uh, gallium nitride, actually. Um, over to my left, the furthest left, is Professor Suji Nakamura. Uh, Professor Nakamura is the Nobel Prize winner uh, for physics uh, in 2014. Uh, and he's known for his invention of the blue LED. To my left, in my immediate left, is uh, Dr. David Lacey, the director of R&D uh, at Osram, uh, based in Penang. And over to the immediate right is uh, Dr. Ahmad Shuhaimi, um, associate, professor, uh, associate Professor, Department of Physics, Faculty of Science, University of Malaya. And to the rightmost is uh, Professor Stephen Danbas, Distinguished Professor, Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of California, Santa Barbara. Very good morning to all of you. Okay, so um, I actually uh, spoke a little bit about this in my previous panel, to which I actually alluded to uh, our big collaboration with uh, University of California. And... Uh, I just would like to maybe start off by going back to how it all started. Uh, and, and back in 20, actually in 2012, we had a big um, retreat and, and a discussion about what's important for the country, Malaysia. And uh, in one of the groups that we have, uh, a group was saying that uh, we're actually quite subservient to technologies from other countries. Uh, at that stage, and that we should take uh, control over some of the technologies that we are using. And one of the areas that was identified is LED. And one of the things that we could do better is to basically find a collaborator, someone who's done um, a lot about how to develop our front-end technology with LED, and thereby giving the ability for Malaysia to take control over some parts of this technology so that we can uh, uh, have control over our own destiny. Our destiny. So, uh, and it so happened, uh, we were uh, lucky that uh, Professor Nakamura in 2014 was presenting his paper uh, in Penang, uh, just on that same topic about epitaxy and about blue LEDs. So we approached him after that, uh, that presentation and we asked, can we collaborate? And he nodded and he went back to uh, California and he sent us a one page proposal uh, to which uh, we, we counter proposed and we said it'd be good if we can actually develop some infrastructure around what he has in Malaysia. And that is the beginning of that, that six year journey that we've had with UNICEF California Santa Barbara. So maybe I'll start off with uh, Professor Nakamura. Uh, what were your thoughts at that stage when we approached you and we actually showed you some things that we were doing in Malaysia. Uh, we were doing some stuff with packaging and so on, but what were you thinking at that stage? Okay, uh, so basically in 2014, you know, I, I, I went to Malaysia because Maida invited me yes. to do a lecture. No? Yes. And after my lecture, you know, we talked about the, you know, how about the LEDs go, uh, what's going on in Malaysia, especially Penang. And because Penang is a hub of LED, especially, you know, Osram is located. And uh, so why don't you, you also, you know, uh, we are doing a lot of research of LED. So why don't you do collaborate with UCSB? Yeah. Because uh, if, uh, you know, Malaysia is a hub of LED, so why don't you do LED research? And, oh, okay, we are interested in it. And we started the program. And now six years later, you know, now already, you know, 
uh, Ma Malaysia, you know, uh, Professor Shaim, uh, the group is already making 180 lumen power to white LEDs in six years. It's an amazing story because yeah. six years ago, basically nothing, you know, in the from nothing from scratch. Now they can make uh, 180 lumen power LEDs and all, they complete all kinds of facilities. It's an amazing story for me. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and about, what about you, uh, uh, David? What, what do you think at that stage? I think you were very early with us uh, looking at the possibilities and you were quite instrumental in helping us develop that journey. So what were you thinking at that stage? Uh, we've been working in, in assembly and test for LEDs for 40 odd years at that time. And uh, in about 2010, 2012, we started commercial production of uh, wafer fabrication in, in Malaysia. So it seemed uh, good to plan for the future where epitaxy would come. It wasn't a plan of our company to do that, but somehow it seemed it would be good to get ready for that. And we were thinking, okay, we should do something in the area of epitaxy, but how to start? And then we should just visit. We had this opportunistic moment where we realized there was an opportunity to collaborate there and enable the local universities to do R&D in the area of epitaxy. So it was taking that chance. Uh, we'd already got something on the radar. We wanted to do something, but we really didn't know what to do or how to do. And with Shuji's visit, suddenly it became clear, okay, this is something we could do. Thank you. So, um, and Steve, you're no stranger to Malaysia. I think you've been working in Malaysia even before the collaboration started with UCSB. And uh, you knew something about what uh, Malaysia can do. So did you think that was a good uh, you know, partnership? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, I've been working in Malaysia since 1990. ability to you know, get the whole supply chain under control. And uh, I was very impressed with the Malaysia researchers in the 90s. So, uh, you know, we just can, we started collaborating and uh, invited many of the researchers over, professors and students. But yeah, I was very happy to go back to uh, Malaysia, Penang and KL to start collaborating on this. Uh, it, just the expertise in, in Malaysia was, was excellent. And, and I think it's continued to help with the pa pa papers we've had joint papers and publications we've had with Malaysia. So I was really happy to collaborate and uh, of course travel to Malaysia. The food's excellent and the people are, are great. Uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Shuhaimi was also um, actually um, on a slightly different path when we, uh, when we, we were talking to, to Steve and Professor Nakamura. So he was just uh, he just returned from Japan after nine years. And he also uh, had planned to develop uh, epitaxy in Malaysia, almost on a separate uh, direction. But we managed to understand his plans and we pulled him in. So maybe if you can share your, your story. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, back then in 2010 to 2015, uh, University of Malaya received uh, roughly, I think, 300 million from the government to increase our ranking to uh, around 100 in the world. So uh, there were a uh, lot of funding coming in. So in the early 2010, we came up with a simple proposal uh, to have epitaxy in Malaysia, uh, in UM. Um, the proposal was to get around 10 million, but finally we, we could secure around nine, 9 million ringgit. Um, and it started from 2011, and we purchased our first CMO CBD in 2013, and the commissioning process took roughly uh, six months. So finally, our CBD CBD were running uh, around the middle of 2014, which is uh, at the right moment with what CRES is doing, because once we have our MOCBD running, then the CRES program started. So uh, I think we are quite fortunate in that uh, sense, uh, because once the, fine, the, the funding for the 
uh, early proposal at the UM completed in 2016, then we write along this uh, Gen on Gen collaboration program for uh, yeah, right. up until today. Right. So, so well, well, he said that he was uh, fortunate. We were also fortunate. Um, essentially, at that stage, um, it, it took some time uh, going back and forth, uh, trying to convince the government that collaboration is, is better. And when we uh, work together with UCSB, uh, who's got you know, a lot of knowledge in this area, um, and we were also fortunate that uh, Dr. Shuhaimi uh, commissioned his uh, reactor uh, relatively quickly because then we actually have a, a platform to work with um, even before you know, the funding arrived at CRES for us to start this program. So, so it was a very fortunate uh, sequence of events for us. Um, so then at that stage, we, we formed uh, you know, a, a multi-organizational uh, group. Uh, we actually at that stage have four universities apart from University of Malaya, we have University of Science Malaysia, USM. We have University of Monash in Malaysia. And we have UNIMAP in Perlis. Uh, each and every one of them have their own uh, separate roles to play in this project. And then we have, obviously, OSRAM. We also have some, also some Malaysian companies who were part of this uh, program to collaborate. And of course, very importantly, we have uh, IPs uh, and knowledge and, and experience coming from UCSB to jumpstart us on this journey. And that, as Tuji said, uh, is an incredible uh, achievement to be able to achieve uh, 170 lumens per watt, uh, which is the measure that the LED industry has on what your capability is uh, within a six year journey. Um, so, uh, at that stage, we actually have a multi-organization uh, uh, project in, uh, in our group. And we have something called an oversight committee chaired by uh, Dr. Lacey. And we meet every two months to which uh, what's incredible to me is that everybody looks in a single direction to what the achievements uh, we needed to have as a single group. And I think that is something that is almost essential in this project. So, so um, Dr. Lacey, do you have any thoughts about what is the importance of the Oversight Committee? Is that important to you? I think that the Oversight Committee drove uh, to achieve the targets for the program. And the targets for the program were rather simple. So we just focused on trying to make an efficient white LED, which was uh, commercially competitive so we so we focused on a single goal uh, and if I can say at the start the universities um, maybe didn't uh, fully appreciate that they, they they felt it was somehow restrictive that we were uh, una within the program we weren't able to explore all the interesting areas of science and technology we were focused on one thing um, but I would say within two years everybody started to realize that this focus on making sure the equipment was ready, the processes were ready, uh, that we were benchmarking between universities, benchmarking with University of California, and we could see step-by-step -step improvement in performance. Everybody uh, started to believe in what we were doing, and, I, and it really drove uh, the caliber of research at the local universities. So it, it really started to result in publication of papers of truly international standard uh, and, and getting Malaysia noticed. So uh, the oversight committee uh, was frustrating, I think, for the universities, but also uh, focused uh, and persistent in, in driving us to achieve the goals we'd set for the program. Thank you. Um, and it, it was also important in that oversight committee, especially when you have uh, multiple universities and they try to outdo each other. So I think that's an important aspect of driving performance. What do you think of that? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think to me, being uh, competitive is very important. Uh, that's why um, at UM, we always compete with USM. 
Yeah. And yeah. of course, USM also always compete with us. So that creates an ecosystem where you know everybody tries to uh, be better than the uh, entity. Um, so that drive innovation as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that is one of the good points we have uh, under collaboration. And Steve, what do you think uh, when we had that kind of competition? Do you see that happening in Malaysia? Yeah, it did. And it, just like he said, it, 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 the competition helps drive students uh, to achieve the, the targets. And, and so we saw this competition between UM and USM. It was a healthy competition, though. Uh, we had both researchers in our lab, and uh, you know, we all would go out to dinner and, and talk about how to achieve the next targets. But I, I think even the, the numbers now are competitive with the University of California, they're competitive with the world. And this is uh, in, a, in an industry white LED lighting, which is so important now for global warming, uh, these efficiencies you can make products with that are really gonna save energy. So I think that also made the students really appreciate the work they were doing is that it had some benefit for humanity beyond just the publications. So that, that drove a lot of the competition as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, Suji, what, what do you think uh, in Malaysia, did you see an improvement over time in your six years when we started? I think we were running all over the place trying to figure out how to do it. But what do you think of, uh, of the team today in Malaysia? Yeah, so initially, you know, when I visited, when we, we, this project started, when I visited Malaysia, initially they have a lot of problems, but more CBD, you have to, you know, a lot of problems. And uh, at that time, I thought, oh, wow, how long does it take to fix the problem of the MOC reactor, you know? Right. I, I, I suggested, oh, you have to modify this part, this one, you know? Yes. And now, you know, uh, I asked the, you know, in Malaysia researcher, oh, how about the MOC? It's a stable? Yeah, very stable. So that's the reason we could achieve the 180 lumen power. So they, uh, I think they worked very hard, you know. Emotion is a key, key of the, you know, LED technology, you know. Okay. So uh, I think yeah. it's, it's amazing. Sir, for yeah. Me. So, so maybe I, I just want to take a few minutes. Uh, we've been talking about the, the material, gallium nitride. Uh, but what is the potential of gallium nitride? Maybe, Suji, can you spend a few minutes on your view of what is gallium nitride? Some of the audience may not know what gallium nitride is. Yeah, gallium nitride is uh, for me the you know Steve said the gallium nitride is third generation semiconductor for me you know uh, second generation uh, uh, semiconductor material because right now gallium nitride is mainly used for LED uh, laser diode emitting devices but this material could be used for power device RF device all kind of device because this is a band energy so it's in the view of the stable of the summer stability is the best so I think the, this gallium nitride for all kinds of devices, no? It's, it's a store, still, you know, the new market is opening. So I think, you know, after silicon, this is the largest market uh, of the, among all kinds of 35 materials. So I think, you know, through this collaboration, you know, Malaysia could do many kinds of government devices in the future, this market. So Osram is, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah, so Osram could help, yeah. you, help a lot. Too. Yeah. And David, what what is gallium nitride? Yeah, I think we've we've sown an important seed because of okay, K. Our focus is optoelectronics, LEDs, and the focus of the program was white LED. Right. But having achieved that and got got a very good uh, commercially competitive performance, we now have a, a a platform in gallium nitride technology where we can make power devices, we can make RF components. We can even consider getting involved in, in other areas of, of gallium nitride research. So, so we've got now a platform at the universities where we can spread out into other areas of, of semiconductor technology. And as, as Suji said, I think for, for a wide range of semiconductors, the gallium nitride option is a higher performance option for the future. So many companies are looking closely at compound semiconductors. And now Malaysia is in a great place. We've got two skilled universities. We've got a whole pool of skilled graduates and, and postgraduates. So it's a great opportunity for companies which want to invest in those technologies to consider Malaysia. Okay. And um, I was having this chat with, uh, with Steve just yesterday, and he was saying that um, there's not that many uh, companies that's actually getting into gallium nitride just yet. 
I think we're at the forefront, as what you say. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, new applications like power electronics or ultraviolet LEDs, uh, even 5G communications, there's very few companies have successfully commercialized it. So I think Malaysia now has the opportunity to be at the leading edge of this, the semiconductor material. And this material has been identified by the US government as being strategically important for climate change. I mean, you could basically, with the power electronics and the LED, you can almost bring a country into uh, matching the Kyoto protocols because of the energy reduction from the power switching is on the same level as the LED lighting. Um, you know, you don't hear a lot in the public about what's the material behind, you know, getting to the electric vehicle of the future or the, uh, the perfect energy efficient uh, solution. So uh, I think that's, that's the kind of area that we now have the ability to start new companies. Um, certainly, the, Malaysia now has that opportunity as well to really embark on these new companies. Uh, so, we've we've got the baseline, I think, at this stage after six years. But can we do it? Um, so let's check with Dr. Shaimi. Is is it possible for Malaysia to go to the next stage with this technology? Yeah, I think of course um, this is the basis the fundamental that we have from the program and of course to upscale is uh, there's a challenge to upscale uh, to mass production but uh, i think anybody can just take the technology uh, and with a proper funding uh, this can be upscaled into a multi-billion dollar business yeah uh, so is it something that we do uh, as as an organization, just one organization, or is it part of a collaborative model? I think uh, Osram is actually one of the companies that I feel has realized the, the power of, of collaboration. And, and uh, you know, with them driving some of the initiatives within Malaysia, uh, it's, it's evident that they have, uh, they, they have belief in the powers of, of collaboration. Can you share a little bit about what you think about collaboration in Malaysia? I think it's really worked for us. So going back to 2014, it, it wasn't really on the radar that we would need Epitaxi in Malaysia. Uh, but within a few years, it became apparent we did need Epitaxi somewhere in Asia. And the decision of our company to choose Malaysia was, was partly driven by this program. So the fact that there was a supply of skilled scientists and engineers who could help us realize our production in Malaysia, that was, a, that was a key factor. So it's worked for us and now we need to extend further. So we see a lot of further opportunity to expand our business in Malaysia, deepen our research and development in Malaysia. And the basis of this program is key for the people we need to do that. So it's key, but I don't think it's just us. So uh, it's great that we had this opportunity to play a key part in starting this program. Uh, but the opportunities of gallium nitride are much broader than the scope of our company. And so there's a great opportunity for others to get involved yeah. and, and run in those directions. Okay. So um, thanks, uh, David. So basically, um, as David says, it's not just a couple of organizations. It's a way, for, uh, being at the forefront of gallium nitride is, is a way for us to now open the doors for, for even more collaboration in the region as well as globally. And I think uh, this is Malaysia embracing that model and, and looking for other organizations, other uh, academic institutions to come in to collaborate uh, with Malaysia and to set up uh, their operation as well in Malaysia. Yeah. So, but, but we've, you know, the six years wasn't an easy one, I, I would say. Yeah, we, we've, there was, when we started the journey, there was no guarantee that we'll get to where we are uh, today. Um, so, um, in, in fact, we were, I felt that we were empowered to basically maybe chart the way uh, over the six years to establish ourselves the way it is. So, what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, while dealing with this program? Uh, David, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Um, the, the, there wasn't a strong ecosystem, so so even simple things like like purchasing equipment, purchasing spare parts, 
purchasing the, the key chemicals, uh, the supply chains didn't really exist. And, yeah. and we, we suffered, some of these chemicals are relatively dangerous and so they need to be handled in, in a special way. Uh, and to find, for instance, port logistics to handle that and, and internal logistics to move the materials around, uh, that took some time to set up and get yeah. that working. Um, and as you say, a, a few times in the program, it got, it got rather frustrating, but I think Crest's program management within the program, the persistence of Crest daily to make sure the program made progress. So as a steering committee, we get involved once a month, one to three, six weeks and try and set some short term direction. But the daily execution run by the team at Crest was absolutely critical to make sure that we, we broke down all of these problems with customs issues, with logistics issues, with equipment that didn't work, electricity supply that wasn't stable, you name it. All those problems needed almost daily persistent action to, to get it through and get those epi reactors into a stable situation. So we apply industrial uptime me mentality and again i think to start with the universities found this very uncomfortable right. with calculating exactly what <laughs> uptimes were right. but now we see the value these machines are running super stable and we understand when they're down why they're down what to do so it's really helped and that enables the research right so this we can only do research when the machines are operating so getting the machines to operate reliably is absolutely key to enabling the research and this program and the program management really made it work thank you Steve, any, any, any thoughts? Yeah, just to reiterate what he said, I, the program management was really excellent. And maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this from the US side, but it's actually better than a program management I get from uh, the US uh, people that fund me, <laughs> if you can believe that. They, I won't name what agency, but it, not only was a monthly meeting, you know, we'd, we'd get weekly emails back and forth, but excellent oversight from Crest to get this program moving. I mean, we started the first two years, I think we're at 20 lumens per watt, which is, you know, just a few percent energy efficient and get it all the way to, to where it is today, which is, you know, so efficient that it's, it's commercially viable was, uh, you know, in part, a uh, large part due to excellent program management and then an excellent group of uh, faculty and, and students to work with. And they were all very open minded, uh, you know, both when we'd visit Malaysia, but also when they come to the US as well. And what was it like uh, at UM <laughs> during that time? Yeah. Uh, Oh, uh, normally, in a, in a common um, uh, funding, uh, university funding that we receive, the reporting is like six months summary after, uh, for example, when we have a two-year funding, we have to come up with a summary of the uh, outcome in every six months. For CRASH, we have to do the reporting every two weeks. So uh, that's the difference. It makes a big difference in how things happen, how fast the feedback uh, can be um, highlighted to the, to the uh, funder. Um, because uh, and also in our oversight committee meeting, we have a very flat structure where students can join together with CRES and other policymakers, uh, NCIA, all the uh, Australian and other uh, um, industries uh, getting in together and any issues with the students can be highlighted direct to the uh, crash management as well as to uh, David Lacey, our chairman of the uh, oversight committee. So I think that, that is a big difference as compared to uh, other funding agency and on how they manage the money or the funding or the progress of, of, of the research. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and part of this program, we actually have uh, visiting researchers that goes to Santa Barbara and spend time with uh, with the team, and and also um, we've also got some research officers from UCSB that spends time in Malaysia to get us going. What do you think of the quality of some of the students that you've seen from Malaysia, Suji? Yeah. Oh yeah, Malaysian students are very you know work very hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So also they are very smart. So I think that's the reason you know within six years they could achieve the very you know uh, 
milestone of 100 lumen part or 200 lumen part. Yeah. Because especially Gang on Gang is a totally new technology. Yes. So the you know Malaysian students challenge this uh, te a new technology and they achieve it. So they work very hard and they are very smart. They are incentive. So I think this is also beginning of the young people in Malaysia. Yes. Because uh, all uh, fundamental facilities there, a taxi technology there, mm -hmm. so they can change you know business. You know, always young people will change everything. You know. Yeah. So they can start a new business using mm -hmm. all kind of facility. You know, because Garim Light like, could be the five, still says five G, Li Fi, power device, five all kind of devices. So. So Malaysian young people can dream the Malaysian dream. You know, America is an American dream. Yes. Now, yeah, a Malaysian, you know, student can dream a Malaysian dream now using uh, these, uh, you know, facilities. Yeah. Okay. So what, what do you think of the talent that we have uh, in Malaysia, uh, David? And the, the talent in the team as well, in, in, uh, that goes back and forth you know, with the yeah, USSB. I, I think that's the great thing about this program. We, uh, we said earlier, we started with a, a simple collaboration proposal, and we counter-proposed something which was a lot more involved, where Malaysian students would study at University of California, and uh, postgraduate students from, from University of California would be uh, based uh, in Malaysia. And we made it an important uh, part of the program that the results must be demonstrated at the Malaysian universities on the Malaysian reactors. And so th that created uh, a great community of researchers, uh, all focused on making sure these Malaysian epi reactors were able to generate the results. Right. And we've now got this group of 70 odd uh, students who've, who've participated in this in this six year activity and they are now contributing to Osram's business and to other companies business both in Malaysia and globally mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a that's a, a great success uh, and we now need to keep it moving so it we've got a great base we've got two great university teams now we need now to feed those teams uh, and and have next generations of students, next right. generations of technology for right. the future. Right. Thank you, Steve. You've also worked with some of these students. What what do you think of of the quality of the students that we have? Yes. So the particularly the PhD students are excellent quality. You know, several of them uh, were getting their PhD at USM or UM came over. So I have uh, at least five joint papers with those students, and then the the PhD students that are getting their PhDs at UCSB are, are excellent. I mean, the, some of our top students right now mm -hmm. just achieving, you know, papers every two, three months, which is a really phenomenal rate. So the, the quality is is world class now. And I think Malaysia is in a unique position to continue the world class uh, leader in this very important semiconductor material. Did you see uh, any before and after to your students when they go to UCSB, uh, Dr. Chani? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, in Malaysia, initially, we were lack of uh, fabrication facilities in Malaysia. We, in UM, for example, we, we had reactor to grow the material, but we didn't have um, much equipment on the fab side before uh, a few years later, then the program actually upgraded some of the fab facilities we have. So in the early stage, it is very important, I think, to us for the students to be properly trained uh, under the program so that when after they come back they can quickly contribute to uh, the research that uh, they're doing and uh, for, for summary uh, in um, looking at the quality of our students uh, along the five years program uh, both UM and USM has produced more than 55 I think more than 60 ISI uh, high tiers papers, tier one, tier two papers. Uh, and we have produced around 25 PhD students, uh, eight master students. So that there's around 30 something students, uh, postgrad students uh, along the way. Uh, so I think that's very important if you're looking from the academic side uh, of the collaboration. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you. So, um, yeah, and, and I, I, I will want to go back to what Tuji said, you know, 
within six years, you can actually get to a point where you actually have a, uh, consistently a team that produces 170 lumens per watt. And, and to, to, to him, to Professor Nakamura, that is incredible. And, and this is the, the, the message that we want to leave you with. It's collaboration. It's leveraging of expertise, knowledge of others to gain and, and to basically improve, create uh, beyond it. Uh, so I think uh, this is how, uh, you know, a, a very good example of how collaboration can jumpstart a country into a technology and also leave behind the, the knowledge in order for us to keep growing and developing uh, future talent along the same lines and so on. So what's, what's, uh, what's next uh, for, for gallium nitride? Uh, I think we've touched a little bit of that. Do you have any other thoughts, uh, Professor Nakamura, for, for Malaysia, for the, where can we fit in into this global scheme of things? Oh, next. Oh, so I truly, so because gallium nitride material is has a lot of opportunity, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, for next generation devices, yes. you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah, so the young, this is the beginning. So young people have to challenge uh, next stage next team the young people always uh, have, want to have a dream no? so young people has to you know start a start a company here venture company yes you know using uh, these facilities already you know this is uh, just beginning so all facilities architectural growth technology of government is uh, almost there everything there all, all tools and facilities there so young people can use these facilities and they can try, uh, you know, venture company, and uh, you know, like uh, I, I want to develop the UVC LED company. I want to start a power electron device. I want a RF company. They can do it now. Yes, this is a great thing. So you know, same thing. Uh, you know, UCSB at uh, Santa Barbara, always young people start up, start company, and yes. they, you know, all economies grow. Yes. So same thing happen in Malaysia. This is great thing for Malaysia, no, especially for young people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So give them hope, give them the tools, and let them start something. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any thoughts, uh, David? Yeah, I, ho I hope exactly we do that. Uh, this ecosystem topic is key for, for Malaysia. So having more companies working in, in, in gallium nitride, having, having startups, having Mm -hmm. other collaborations it's really important to to strengthen the the ecosystem further uh i can imagine uh, a number of opportunities immediately where current students or students who finished could jump into areas of the technology we've developed we mentioned uv for instance yeah. uh, there's things which which uh the students could do if if they're entrepreneurially minded they could they've got enough technology knowledge they've got a strong backbone in Crest and the universities, yes. uh, they could jump into something. Could be okay. fun. Okay. Steve, any thoughts? Yeah, just reiterating what Sudhi and David said. So the, the new industries like the coronavirus pandemic suddenly created a need for ultraviolet LEDs. Yes. Uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement because the efficiencies aren't, aren't the power is not big enough yet to totally disinfect the air and things like that. But that is one opportunity that, that we have now it is to really increase the efficiency of ultraviolet LEDs so that we can put them in disinfection of air systems and surfaces. Uh, but we need more improvements there. That, that'd be one opportunity that I would see coming out of this program. Uh, and the other one is, is the power electronics because it's not just electric vehicles, but just the, uh, the wall sockets you plug in to power your iPhone. Those are switching over to gallium nitride now, more efficient and, and uh, much faster charging. So there's been several startups in the U.S. focused around uh, both of those areas. And we didn't even touch on the area of micro LEDs, which is that we believe most displays in the future are going to switch to all gallium nitride uh, or gallium nitride in, in combination with gallium arsenide for red, green, blue displays. And that, that's a, a whole other industry involving not just TV, but mobile devices and projection devices. Uh, I've even heard of LiDAR applications now which, uh, the, with the laser applications. So... It's really up to the imagination of the, the students that we've hopefully uh, created that they'll, they'll come up with the next generation of applications and devices. So do you see any assignment like that among your students, Dr. Shaimi? Uh, yes. Um, 
of course, we know the uh, the Gen on Gen program is just a five year program, so we have to plan ahead of yeah. beyond beyond that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why uh, when we have the Gen on Gen uh, reaching a rather stable uh, performance, we then um, also move into uh, power electronics a bit. So we are doing uh, GAN on silicon for power devices right now. Uh, the FP is getting uh, stable. Um, and of course, uh, in the model of, we, we are not just doing research, we try to hook up direct with industries. So uh, in the uh, power electronic um, platform, we are working with one of Malaysia Malaysia-based uh, foundry uh, on the eight-inch wafer, and also uh, upcoming under a new funding from Mosti, we are working with another um, microelectronic institute in Malaysia together with uh, uh, silicon foundry uh, in Malaysia for uh, eight-inch gain on silicon power electronic. So um, it's very exciting time for us because uh, with this new uh, projects, uh, we get the, the people uh, excited towards new thing. Uh, and also not just power electronics, uh, with the upgrade that we plan uh, in our facilities, we are going to do uh, the UV, UV LED as well fr from, from next year. So uh, I think the public doesn't really understand why gallium nitride power devices is so hot right now. Uh, if you are using silicon uh, power devices, for power conversion, you will get roughly 93%, uh, 94% of efficiency. But if you switch the material to gallium nitride, you can get more than 98%, easily get 98 to 99% of efficiency. So uh, that's very high, very high jump. And the market is big for uh, not just um, USB charging, but also for data centers, especially because people uh, in the data center. Uh, in a server farm, you can uh, save a lot of money. I think, I think two billion dollar for five years for one data center if they switch to uh, again based power devices for their servers. So that, that's make the program or uh, the, the, the research team that we have uh, excited to towards new thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shami. So we actually have a question from the audience. Can I get the question? Thank you. Um, very esteemed colleagues here. Thank you. Um, I have a question because as an end user, we've seen how gallium nitride has been particularly useful for chargers, uh, the significant improvement. How do you see that happening in Malaysia? And you know, um, where do you see the technology? Because I think at the moment, the supply is very limited. And the number of vendors are very limited. Um, but you know, the efficiencies are tremendous. Uh, you can see it's, uh, you know, the power from a single small brick used to come from a much larger brick. So any thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Does anyone want to pick that? Sure. Uh, you're right. And I think, again, it's, it's access to technology is the reason, right? So there's a few companies which have got access to compound semiconductor technology and can make these things. Uh, and what we would expect is that those silicon companies are now looking around at, at compound semiconductor technology and realizing they need to get in there because silicon is maturing or has matured. And if you want to compete with higher efficiency, you've got to get involved in compound semiconductors. So that's a great opportunity now, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a wide range of semiconductor companies in Malaysia, majority focusing on silicon right now, yeah? So as a corporate level, they start to think about, hey, compound semiconductors, we need to get involved. And Malaysia's in a position saying, hey, we've got good, good universities, we've got a pool of good students. That development and research can be done in Malaysia. That's a great opportunity for Malaysia uh, and will enable those companies to, to step in. But you're right, right now it's, it's a bit of a niche, but it's clear the only way is compound semiconductor technology. You can't do this any other way. For chargers, for electric vehicles, for all the power conversion topics, Compound semiconductors away. Is anyone taking this technology and running away with it, uh, Steve? Yeah, just one comment. Yeah, I think 
one of the keys is that the Malaysia now has the gallium nitride epitaxy. You may or may not know most of the those uh, power applications are gallium nitride integrated with silicon, so it's it's grown on silicon. So we now it's called heterogeneous integration, which is a fancy word for just saying we're sticking the gallium nitride on silicon wafers, and that gives them the cost efficiency, and that's very hard to do. So that's why there's so few vendors in the world that can really produce that at low defect density. Uh, but I think Professor Shuhaimi's group is a leader in this field. He's had 20 years of experience, I think, of gallium nitride on silicon. So if anybody can do it, he can do it. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's <laughs> Uh, for gain on silicon, I've been working on that for six years when I did my PhD in Japan. So uh, I did LED on silicon back then. Uh, the lab, the whole lab was working on uh, power hands on gain on silicon power hands. Um, I was the only one working on the on the electronic uh, on the uh, light emission side of the devices. And uh, for us, uh, under the new collaboration that we have, we plan to collaborate with those uh, researchers as well in Japan uh, and. If you look, uh, maybe it's not appearing uh, in the public, but uh, if you ask around the manufacturers in Malaysia, uh, there are movement among the uh, silicon-based foundries to also explore uh, a compound semiconductor like test. I cannot name it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we know because uh, my, we, we are sending students to all of these uh, foundries. So we know what is happening a bit uh, in the in internal of those uh, organizations. Right. Yeah. Any other questions from uh, from the floor before? Yes. Hi, I'm Rafiza. I'm from Cradle. So I was just. Um, you know, listening to the conversation, how you're trying to encourage university students, young entrepreneurs um, to actually partner with you to perhaps, you know, they, they, you know, a lot of these young entrepreneur startups, you know, they're, they're very good at commercializing something, you know, and I think it will be a very good partnership. So what are the things that you have currently in mind? Do you have any specific programs? Because as you know, Cradle, we have, you know, we're funded 1,000 startups um, in Malaysia, so we've, you know, we've created quite a number of notable uh, startups. Grab is one of them. You know, we've provided grants to two, two grants to them. So, is there a way where you know um, any specific programs that our startups can tap and work with you? Um, because we have a lot of hungry kids out there, um, and you guys have got you know really fantastic uh, R and D capability, which is not something that they can have so is there any specific programs that you have currently in mind because I think we've got a lot of startups on our portfolio that could really benefit partnership with you guys thanks thank you so much for that question Rafiza um, and, it's, and it's an excellent question um, yeah so we would love to work with Cradle on this to basically get the, uh, the startup uh, kids to come and look at the opportunities. However, there's, uh, there's a bit of a, uh, you know, um, you, you need to know that the, the area that, that this is, is quite uh, engineering focused. So it's the turnaround for an, a, a big economy uh, type of business, a startup business is very, very fast within weeks sometimes uh, and maybe months. But uh, for for an engineering base, am I uh, maybe you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Uh, but an engineering one, you need to have a bit more um, stamina in terms of being at the lab, making it repeatable, and so on, before it becomes a product, and it has to be validated by various people. So you have, and but once there, it's very lucrative. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe uh, David, you want to comment a little bit? Yeah, it, hardware takes a longer time, but the, I think the opportunity is that it's like a have made opportunity. So if we can identify applications and designs which we think have got opportunities in the market, we don't have to build manufacturing from scratch. We can take those designs to companies, we can take our EPI recipes to companies, and we can use that approach to, to find a way to scale the technology. Uh, 
hardware is more difficult, no question about it, but it's also more embedded, right? So once you, once you invest in a hardware business, it's there, right? You can't, it won't move around. It, it stays where, it's where you invest. So it makes sense to think a bit longer term and uh, do some incremental investment in these technologies uh, for the long term. But right now you can start a business based upon a design or based upon a recipe, which we have, and find an existing company to help you take that to market. Steve, anything? Sure, I've been involved with three university startups in, in, the, in the US and worked with lots of venture capitalists, you know, talk to venture capitalists, uh, even in Malaysia, Kazana and other ones. And the, the key thing I think is that this is a hardware business. So the, the venture investment you need, it has to be long term, has to be like three year commitments. Uh, but after generally two to three years, you start seeing a lot of fruits from these types of companies. Um, I would encourage, uh, you know, some of the things Professor Shuhami works on, if he can find a good strategic partner that he raised venture funding, uh, you know, that usually gives the validation. And then there's there's lots of, as long as there's a funding mechanism within Malaysia to, to get it to the three year mark, I think they, they'll realize commercial success. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, we are looking for such opportunities uh, to, to fund uh, our innovation and come up with something that can be commercialized. Uh, and uh, yeah, as a university, they, they're always forcing me to do that as well. So, but uh, to me, there's some challenges as well uh, to directly move from prototype to mass manufacturing because um, in manufacturing, they have different challenges that we don't know uh, because we are just a, a university researchers. Uh, but if you can solve those issues or tackle those issues, then I think it's, it's a uh, would become a very uh, amazing journey for another startups. Thank you, Doc. So, um, Suji, do you have anything to add? Or? Uh, my opinion is uh, depend on the young people. You yeah. know, if uh, one young people has a big motivation incentive to start a company. He, he or she can do anything because David always says, you know, there are the hardware of galvanized materials, epoxy, everything. Hardware is there. So young people have a big incentive to use this hardware to do something, to start a company. He or she can do anything because uh, all the hardware is there. So also, same time, he or she needs uh, funding. Funding is the biggest challenge, but the there are a lot of LED or like Australian companies there. If company will support this young people, anything okay. For example, in my case, I, I invented Blue that uh, in Japan, small company, no background in semiconductor technology. Just uh, fund, uh, funded me a lot, funded me a lot. So that's the uh, funding. I didn't worry about the funding, but uh, nothing. But I could uh, invent Blue LED, it's just uh, three years. <laughs> So most important individuality, he or she has a big incentive or motivation to do something. He or she can do anything. All the hardware there, he can she use this hardware of garum nitride. And uh, in the future, you know, uh, same as uh, Elon Musk, you know, he or she had a big incentive. Yes. That's the most important. Yes. Thank you, Suji. So nobody knows better than Suji because he had his incredible journey getting to where he is take uh, from uh, someone in an island uh, in Japan and having the, the tenacity and drive to create his own MOCVD out of a very small budget. Uh, he, he's got that motivation and, you know, uh, look where he is today. So, so if that was a message that we want to send out to the young people, this is what we want them to understand, that you have to have that drive. Yeah. So, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, any other questions from the? Oh yes, please. Hi, Hafiz here. Um, uh, I am currently running a company, a, start a startup doing robots. Um, there is this one common issue that we are having in Malaysia. When we are talking about doing innovations, we are doing uh, startups. People are going towards digital instead of hardware. 
Um, the re one of the reasons I can say is that uh, we've, been gone, we've gone through all of the processes. Uh, and the thing is that when we want to talk about hardware, when we talk about getting funding, getting investors in, they keep on talking about ITs. And in Malaysia, when we talk about ITs, the process is very long. So for example, if you were to ask me, do I have any IPs? My answer is no. Usually it's no, but I have a business going on and it's, and it's working. However, all the investors, when they want to fund in, they are looking for IPs. So usually when, if I have an IP, the IP has been approved, but the IP was three years ago. It took us three years to just get an IP uh, in Malaysia. So if we were to go towards uh, innovation, especially hardware, in Malaysia, the software part is very is moving very fast. In terms of how well we are we are behind a bit. So how do you want to make sure that if we were to be uh, leading this innovation uh, scale, how can we speed up all of these processes so that we can get these IPs, that we can convince all of these fundings, all the all the venture capitalists that we do have the technology, but we need to move fast. Because of this, we are getting sandwiched. So we want to move fast, we have the technology, they are looking for IPs, we don't have the IPs because it's filing, it's going to take us three years. After three years, they will revert back, we need to change this and then the process goes on and on. Three years, three years, three years, three years. So these are the, these, it's an endless cycle for us. So that's why we, as a, even for me as a startup, we do technologies when it comes to robotics, all the small, small, even small scale, it doesn't matter. As long as it works, it's fine for us. Uh, so for... For me, if you would, uh, my question to all of you, how can, how can you assist all of us, let's say if you were uh, to have our incubation here in Malaysia in terms of hardware, how do we speed these things up? How do you inspire them to make uh, innovations faster? And how do you make that, uh, all the infrastructures to support these R&Ds, all the small, small companies to scale up faster? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, anyone from the floor who wants to start first? So, so uh, Suji's probably filed 500 patents, so he's an expert in it. But, <laughs> but let me just tell you about the process. So for us, when you said three years, what we do, and you could do it as well, is file a provisional patent in the U.S. It doesn't mat matter for the venture capitalists, at least in the United States, if your patent's issued yet, as long as you could say, I have a provisional patent application on file. So we file a lot of provisionals, which don't cost that much money. Well, relatively 10,000 or so, and that gets you the priority date. Um, so our, our mechanism is, you know, we actually had companies that were uh, sold even before the first patents were issued. So it's, it's, it's just the investors need to see that you've, you've gotten some provisional patent applications in. Um, so I would encourage you to do that and maybe some PCT uh, patents because the most important markets to protector the global markets uh, and i would think you could get uh, patents i don't know that much about the malaysian patent system but i do see malaysian companies filing patents in the u.s as follow on as well so uh like i said you don't have to have an issued patent you just have to have those those uh, provisional patents filed and before you convert them so that's that's what i would do is try to file quite a few provisional patents yeah i agree from it so, uh, yeah, my story, you know, at the Nichia, my former company, uh, 100 percent chemical company, no background in semiconductor technology. When I started blue LED, no one understand what, what blue LED, what I can't even write that. Right? So I asked uh, IP division there. So I asked, the, uh, I, I draft the patent, and uh, why don't you write the patent? They cannot. They ask the outside lawyer to write the patent. Also, as a lawyer, you know, uh, nobody knows in uh, Tokushima is a local city. Even when IP lawyer doesn't know anything about semiconductor, so he wrote the part, he wrote the pattern. Oh, crappy, no meaning. <laughs> so you know, I have to devise everything. So from next time, I have had to write all kind of patent specification everything myself. You know, so since at that time, I think all all of Nichas patent, I got two hundred. I wrote myself everything. That is the fast because if I wrote yeah. I have to modify, uh, devise everything. So you had the same thing, you know, I don't manage, I don't got him right, I knew. So, you know, you have to do everything. Basically, it depends, I told you. Everything depends on young or she. Have incentive, motivation. I have to do everything, IP, everything, from nothing at Nichia. So now, now Nichia, you know, 
还有好呃百比较呃是是这个韩版了。所以 I think you have the same right now nothing in Malaysia, but the hardware they are getting right now. IT everything you have to do that is you you have motivation you can do anything. That's most important. Yeah. If I can add, I think you you just need to keep moving with the IP thing. Yes, it takes time. Uh, it certainly helps if you can write yourself, uh, and it helps if you have a it within your organization some ideation mechanism or a uh, way of making people think about uh, creating uh, intellectual property all the time. I know now and again you stumble across something and you think, oh, that's something I should patent. But if you can get into a mode where you find small incremental things, you can build up uh, uh, a base of IP which really helps any company. Because as an investor, you, you, of course, you want to invest in something unique, something uh, where there's some solid value there, and if you can end up with a with a with a bunch of intellectual property, you've got maybe one original idea, and then a bunch of incremental improvements upon that or changes upon that. Then that's what that's what any uh, uh, investor would want to see. And if you do end up in any form of clash with another company when they come to you and say, "Hey, we've got IP." on your topic if you've got a bunch of follow-up uh, ip as well you're in a much better negotiating position so i agree with you it's slow and it's difficult but it's it's the long-term value for any form of uh, idea-based organization and it's more important uh, not to bet everything on one or two but try and find ways to create lots of incremental improvements so that you've got a uh, a wide range of IP. Thank you. Um, Doc, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, maybe um, I would suggest you to work with maybe some universities, for example, in IP protection, because in every university is now they have patent office, they have proper offices uh, who can, uh, even lawyers who can. Uh, uh, can discuss with you on what what you should protect uh, in your IP filing, and also for us, uh, based on my experience in UM, we always write our own IP first. We don't really rely on the lawyers to write for us, because if it comes from the lawyers, uh, we are not sure whether they understand the technology or not. That, that, that's the uh, main issue that we have in Malaysia uh, ecosystem. Uh, so that's why we come up with our own writing first and the lawyer we just uh maybe they they go through and just to turn that writing or manuscript into something that is uh yeah uh, lawyer related um and then uh, on the filing side uh, we always find a good uh ip filing company so there's a lot in Malaysia. Uh, so always go for the, the better ones. Yeah. For, for the, for the, so uh, I think that can help a bit on, on my question. And on the hardware side of IP filing, it doesn't move as fast as uh, software. So that's why uh, even if you are talking about GAN on silicon technologies, up until today, there, there are very few companies in the world that can and do that uh, with fat free uh, Philips. So, um, yeah, for us, we are quite fortunate because we're going towards the highway side. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting very good questions from the crowd. Is there any other questions? Do we have time for any other questions? Okay. Do we have any more questions from the crowd? Okay. So, so um, maybe a, a very quick round on whether the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has helped or is, is a, you know, is a hindrance to, to what we're doing. Suji, is it, does, did it help us? Yeah, yeah. yeah. in my field of research, it uh, just, for, you know, it helped me a lot about it to do research with my students. 
because uh, I moved to the United States in 2000 to, to become a professor. And since that time, you know, I, I, I had to travel all over the world to mainly for fundraising with Steve, you know, and uh, no time to work with students closely because I had to travel a lot. But uh, due to COVID-19, we can't travel at all. So <laughs> past uh, almost two years, we have to stay at the university to work together with students very closely to, to you know. So recently uh, we could uh, do that there's some development of invention of students because we had to work together very closely. So it helps a lot to, to you know, generate a lot of innovation and development of the garden light based devices recently. It helps a lot, yeah. I think in this program, because of the nature of it, we already were using video conferencing and those techniques to keep in touch anyway. So uh, from that perspective, it didn't have a great impact because we were already used to those types of, uh, of communication technologies. As the pandemic started, we also said to the students, use this time. Okay, you can't work in the lab physically anymore, but you can put work into your thesis. You can write a publication, you can, think about invention and, and patterns. So use this, this time to, to do uh, other dimensions of the work. So I hope it certainly was less productive for us and, and, and our, what had been continuous movement of students between the different universities was halted, which is unfortunate. Um, but still, I, I hope it wasn't a, a, a complete disaster. We were able to find ways to keep moving uh, keep collaborating even even during it, and of course one side benefit was uh, this focus on ultraviolet LEDs as a result of of, uh, of the pandemic. People realizing that the, the gallium nitride technology has got a, a potential solution to some of the issues which have come to light in the pandemic. So that gives us a new focus and hopefully uh, some new opportunities for funding for further research. Thank you. Uh, don't shine me. Um, we had problem a bit last year uh, when the MCO one comes in. Uh, every every activity stop in the lab for I think like three months, uh, and then um, and we have to limit students coming to the lab. So, uh, but I, I think that that doesn't that doesn't uh, uh, make a problem much to us our problem is our main uh, issue is that uh, vendors cannot come in when uh, there is any breakdown in the lab so that, that is the biggest issue even uh, our second MOCPD is still uh, we have it uh, installed everything but cannot be permission because of uh, the pandemic but that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the maybe not, not the good side of it but in the uh, bright side of the story, um, we have more and more PhDs graduating <laughs> within the pandemic period. Yeah. Uh, also, I think the publication, we have doubled the publication compared to previous year because of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, students, as David says, uh, they more focus on what uh, the publication and thesis writing. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, and on the performance or the achievement of the, on, on the LED performance, I think we can increase further uh, and faster if the pandemic is not there. But of, of course, we are still uh, working on it to increase the performance further. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Steve? Uh, just quickly, just reiterate uh, what Shuhani said. So it, it did slow us down. The supply chain too was the biggest thing, but it did, like Suji mentioned, it really made the students and the professors really focus on what experiments could be done. And it made you them work, I think, smarter. Uh, we all got better at Zoom, in addition. And then the new applications that came out of thinking about it, you know, uh, I think before the pandemic, nobody thought to use UV LEDs to purify water bottles. Now you can buy UV LEDs in water bottles everywhere. So it's things like that. But it's, it's, it's really the focus it's brought. But hopefully we can all now start to get back to you know, speed up the work and hopefully solve some of the supply chain issues with semiconductors. Thanks. Thank you. So if there's no other questions from the floor, um, I, I guess we've come to the end of this panel session. Maybe I'll just go one round 
uh, with everybody to see uh, any final words uh, before we end. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I told so, so already a hardware, you know, David said hardware of Garam Nitride, right, uh, you know, facilities here. So I said, most important thing, young people, young people, you know, one, what, at least two, yeah, yeah, any number of young people. It's a, a big incentive, motivation to, to start company. And he or she can do anything right now. The most important, how was she incentive, big incentive, motivation. That's the most important because my story, same in Japan, what I did, you know, same story, just a one, one person changed everything, you know, even the small budget, nothing, but yeah, all the fundamental resources, yeah, you know, everything, you know, hardware and funding opportunity also available. So he, he worked very hard. That's the most important. Um, just to summarize the, the, the program, you know, I think at the start, we didn't quite know what to do. Uh, we opportunistically uh, managed to find a way to collaborate with the team at UCSB and, uh, and you see the results here, uh, more than we expected. I would say for everybody uh, in the team, I think we've achieved more than, than we expected. Um, and I encourage other industries and other university groups to do the same. So the international collaboration at the university level has proven really valuable, really, really incredibly valuable. So uh, other industries and other universities in Malaysia really do think about that. Find, find a partner university in another country, find a supportive industrial sector or individual company and, and build a collaboration together. Uh, it's, this is a great example of what can be done. Thank you, David. Dr. Shami? Um, I, I, would, I just want to highlight on collaboration. I think uh, this achievement would never be here if there's no collaboration. Uh, and because of the strong collaboration we have with the UCSB, industries and the commitment from the students, uh, the professors in the universities. So we have this kind of achievement uh, in Malaysia. Um, so uh, for future programs, I think it has to be designed the same way where we get a really passionate and hardworking students to work for any collaborations and make sure that you work with the correct people, uh, the best people if you can. Uh, to create the best outcome from the money that you're getting uh, for, from the government. Yeah, to reiterate that, I guess I just closing. So like say, I'm looking forward to the next five years. You know, this is the first trip I took in almost two years. So it, it shows that we strongly believe in this program. And uh, really, we've identified some really new, exciting markets. And, and I can't wait to get back to uh, Malaysia to have some hawker food. <laughs> So, uh, so with that, uh, you know, I would like uh, the audience maybe to, to give a round of applause to the esteemed panel that we have. Thank you so much. Um, so, so thank you so much. And I, I wouldn't uh, summarize this because I think uh, the panelists did uh, do that. So over back to you, uh, Ben. Thank you very much, Inter Jeffrey. A round of applause once again to our panel, ladies and gentlemen. very much proof that you know Malaysia is a great place to collaborate but I just want to go one step further and support my my brother who has the same surname as me but we are industry brothers okay but not blood relative brothers but because we work so well together but gentlemen one thing that we've been doing with each session especially the moderated session we ask each speaker of the panel just to give one word to just sum up the topic and it just has to be one way. I know it's a bit of a challenge. I'm going to throw it at you last minute. This is not scripted. Either. I'm going to challenge your innovative minds. But just one word that comes to mind when, it says, when you think about the three words or two words or three words, actually, collaboration in Malaysia in a positive way. So we're going to take that word and then we're going to put it in the post of the video. So, you know, when you describe a video, you look at the video and you say, what is this video all about? What is this interview all about? You know, yes, it's about, you know, creating tomorrow sustainable startups, you know, you know, breaking down the bar barriers, transcending. But what, what does it actually mean? What is the deep detail of it? As we always say in entrepreneurship and academia, it's the devil's in the detail, isn't it? So 
just one word to tease our audience, and then we're gonna put it there. And then that gives them even more incentive to click that play button, to click that like button, to click that follow button, and to click that share button. So on that share button, share the one word that starts, that is coming into your mind right now. Five, four, three, two, one, sir. Uh, People. Passion. Passion. Hope. Hope. Sounds like a Star Wars movie. Okay. <laughs> Realistic. Okay. Sorry, say again. Challenge. Challenge. All those words are what this talk is all about. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fantastic session, collaborative session between five great minds. And in Malaysia, once we make people do some work, you know what we do after that? We buy them lunch. Okay, so on that note, we're going to buy lunch to our five esteemed speakers because food is not just everything in Malaysia. It's food for thought in terms of putting food in our stomachs and also food for our minds so we can think about the next big collaboration. My name is Ben Ibrahim. Please join us back at two o'clock. We've got two individual keynote sessions. And then after that, Richard Jeffrey is going to come back and he's going to be a speaker. Well, as part of a panel for the last session of today, we're working him very hard, but as they say, that is part of the collaboration business. You've been a great audience virtually. This audience here has been fantastic physically. We look forward to seeing you at two o'clock Dubai time, six o'clock Malaysian time. Don't go away. We'll catch you then. <laughs>